Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Columbia, South Carolina Mayor and Conference of Mayors President, Steve Benjamin. Good afternoon, everyone. And you having fun so far? All right, welcome to the 87th uh, annual winter meeting of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. It's my honor to acknowledge uh, my fellow leaders in conference leadership, uh, Vice President Brian Barnett of Rochester Hills, Michigan, uh, our second Vice President Greg Fisher of Louisville, uh, past President Elizabeth Couts of Burnsville, Minnesota, and of course our CEO and our Executive Director Tom Cochran. Uh, please give them and our staff a, a round of applause for their great work. So thankful uh, to our staff, we all are, for the incredible work in pulling all of this together. I want to welcome all of our mayors who travel to be a part of this meeting. We know it's not easy to be away from your cities, uh, and, um, and, and certainly we want to make sure it, you understand exactly how much we appreciate you joining us for this important gathering. Can all of the mayors take a moment and just stand up uh, for a second? All the mayors. Record turnout, guys. Record, record turnout of mayors from across the country. Largest attendance ever. Thank you so much. So proud to be a colleague of yours. As a reminder, uh, all of our plenary sessions are live streamed uh, and available at usmayors.org and on the United States Conference of Mayors YouTube uh, channel. For those of you on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, use the hashtag MayorsDC19 when posting about this gathering, MayorsDC19. We also invite you to download and use the, the U.S. Conference of Mayors official app. It's available on iPhone, iPad, and all Android devices as well. Um, I do want to take a moment to, to thank the sponsors of this year's uh, winter meeting for their support of our endeavors, of the AARP, American Beverage Association, Americans for the Arts, the American Hotel and Lodging Association, the Edison Electric Institute, Google, HDR, Ike Smart City, J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, Postmates, Starbucks Coffee Company, Suez, Target Corporation, Uber Technologies, the Walmart Family Foundation, WeWork, and of course our title sponsor, Wells Fargo. Please give them all a round of applause. Now, it's my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce our host city mayor for a welcome to her city. I want to thank uh, our, our host for arranging a special reception for all of our winter meeting uh, participants tomorrow evening, as she's done for us in, in previous years. So please join me in welcoming the mayor of the great District of Columbia, Mayor Muriel Bowser. Well, thank you everyone for being here and welcome to Washington, D.C. I want to thank you, President Benjamin, and all the leadership of the U.S. Conference of Mayors for hosting another wonderful winter meeting. Please give President Benjamin our appreciation. And I am so very proud to represent 700,000 Washingtonians and proud to be a partner with you in this work. We, of course, represent the governments that aren't shut down, uh, the governments that can't shut down, because our residents rely on us every single day to keep our communities moving forward to keep them safe and to provide the basics from health care to education to picking up trash. In many ways, it is so fitting that America's mayors are right here in Washington, D.C., just steps from the White House and steps from the Capitol, collaborating, working together to better our cities. At the same time, uh, we're calling on our federal government to do the same. Because one thing that we have seen year after years that when the federal government can't find a way to get the job done, America's mayors will. So this week, I know uh, that we will be talking about a range of issues from how we close the achievement gap, the income gap, and opportunity gaps in our city. 
We will talk about how to end the opioid epidemic that is wreaking havoc on families and communities across our nation. We will talk about how to reduce maternal mortality rates and get to the root of why they are disproportionately affecting women of color. We will talk about how to spread prosperity and ensure that all of our residents feel like they have access to opportunities that are fair and valuable. Our communities may not all look the same. Our challenges and successes may not all be the same either. But at the end of the day, the people that we represent have similar dreams and aspirations. And they are counting on us to lead, to be bold, and to do the work that will help them live healthy, happy lives in safe communities where they can take care and raise their children to be all that they can be too. So welcome to your nation's capital. I hope that you get a chance to see some of our city. Uh, and I will join with President Benjamin in uh, inviting you to the DC welcome reception uh, that we will host with the Canadian ambassador to the United States, David McNaughton, tomorrow night. Please RSVP if you plan to attend. Have a great conference. I want to thank Mayor Bowser. Uh, I would like to introduce our sponsor, uh, Rachel Holt. Rachel leads Uber's new modalities organization, which includes jump and the ramp up and onboarding of additional mobility services, uh, such as public transit integration, scooters, car rentals, and bikes. She joined Uber as the general manager of Washington, D.C., growing the city into one of Uber's largest and fastest growing markets at the time. She was ranked number nine on Fortune's 40 Under 40 in 2016 and was named by Fast Company as one of the most creative people in business. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Holt and thanking Uber for sponsoring this lunch. Thank you, Mayor Benjamin, for that kind introduction. And on behalf of Uber, it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to the city I call home. Uh, it was also my pleasure to, to share this stage with uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser. As the first general manager of Uber's Washington, D.C. business, I'm especially grateful to Mayor Bowser for her leadership in welcoming ride sharing to the D.C. metro area, where we're proud to now provide flexible work opportunities to over 40,000 people every week. Like, like Mayor Bowser, for many of you, your first introduction to Uber may have been in the context of controversy. When I joined the company back in 2011, we were a tiny 30-person startup with a lot to learn about working with cities, and it showed. I can tell you that thanks to new leadership and some humbling lessons along the way, we've come a long way. One of the lessons we've learned is that when Uber partners with governments, together we can do great things. Uh, in Mayor Benjamin's home city of Columbia, we're partnering with local transit agency, the local transit agency there, Comet, to make it easier for people living in food deserts to get to and from grocery stores. One of the major impediments to people keeping jobs is, of course, transportation. So here in DC, we're working with the mayor's office to help formerly incarcerated DC residents to their new paralegal jobs. And next week marks the one year anniversary of our partnership with the city of Cincinnati to collaborate on how to improve transit ridership and make the city's commutes faster and more sustainable. We're also growing our jump business, bringing scooters and e-bikes to the streets of cities all across the United States, including here in DC. So if you look for our bright red e-bikes, and I hope you'll give them a try uh, during your stay here. As you can see, one of the other things we've learned is that cars are not always the best way to get where you're going, especially for short trips in crowded cities. So we're now looking beyond cars to build the first truly global multimodal platform. We want to use technology to help people in cities you lead help get from point A to point B in whatever way works for them and their cities. That may be on an electric scooter, on an e-bike, on public transit, or in a shared ride. So mayors, as you continue to think about the future of mobility, let's keep finding new ways to work together to help people find access to reliable, affordable, and sustainable ways to get around. And we want to hear from you. 
Um, many of you already know your Uber local policy person, um, but if you don't, please send us an email, mayors at uber.com, um, and we'll be happy to talk about ways we can partner together. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Our next speaker uh, has held many important titles. Presiding Judge, Indiana State Attorney General, Mayor of Gary, Indiana, uh, Chair of the United States Council of Mayors Criminal and Social Justice Committee. She's been a star of an episode of Undercover Boss. And now she's president of the National League of Cities. Uh, but the titles that I like most are friend and sister. Uh, please join me in welcoming Gary, Indiana Mayor and National League of Cities President Karen Freeman Wilson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is my distinct honor to bring you greetings on behalf of the board and staff of the National League of Cities. And while I appreciate uh, the gracious introduction from our fearless leader, uh, he is right. The greatest title that I cherish from him is to be his friend and sister. I know that our organizations have so much in common. Not only do we have a long time collaboration, but we have in common the people in the communities that we serve. Uh, just like the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National League of Cities serves in a bipartisan way. Whether you look at the leadership team of Mayor Benjamin and Mayor Brian Barnett and Mayor Greg Fisher, all of whom I consider friends, and their partnership around infrastructure, innovation, and inclusion, or whether you look at uh, the work that we all look to do to move our communities forward, it is clearly a partnership out of necessity, a partnership that has grown out of our love for cities, but most importantly, a partnership that grows out of our love for people. Mayor Bowser is right. And so many of you know this, that we don't have the luxury of not getting it done because our citizens look forward to us getting the work done day in and day out, whether we're in D.C. or whether we're home serving them uh, in our respective cities. I think about a woman who seems to email me every week, and every week, she has a, a different problem for me to solve. Now, you know, some of you get those emails from your citizens, and um, even though Gary is a smaller city, I know that those of you who lead in cities of one million people or even larger get the same emails from that one or two or 10 citizens. And I do my best to answer those emails, not just because she's entitled to an answer, but because it reminds me why we do the job in the first place. It's not because of power or position, it's because of the fact that we love people and we understand that it's the citizens that we serve who count on us to elect them every day. And so congratulations. <laughs> congratulations on record attendance. Congratulations on what I know will be a very productive meeting. And thank you for counting the National League of Cities among your very important partners. Thank you and have a great meeting. Thank you, Mayor Freeman Wilson. 
Um, um, we talk a lot about big issues at this meeting, but sometimes it's the little things close to home uh, that make a big impact for our citizens. Our pets are one of those uh, issues. Research shows that people with pets get more exercise, report less loneliness and stress, and have stronger social ties, all benefits that foster healthy communities. So when cities are better for pets, they're better for everyone. I'm pleased to announce that again this year, the U.S. Conference of Mayors and Mars Pet Care uh, will offer Better Cities for Pets grants to help cities become more pet friendly. Last year's recipients, Fort Worth Mayor uh, Betsy Price, Richmond Mayor uh, LeVar Stoney, and Hallandale Beach Mayor Adams are making great progress with their pet friendly initiatives. Mars Pet Care wants to help your cities too. The application process is going to open soon. I hope you consider applying. The Mars team will be in the exhibit area uh, in the hallway. You guys know, run the gauntlet down the hallway, talk to all of our wonderful supporters and sponsors, and they'd love to tell you more. So, also for the last four years, the U.S. Comps of Mayors has partnered with Major League Baseball on its play ball program. In 2018, more than 300 mayors and over 35,000 children participated in this program. That's a new record. Uh, so we're excited about this incredible partnership. Uh, we're releasing today the 2018 Play Ball Report, which, which will be sent to Play Ball mayors. So guys, keep your eyes out for this. Uh, but today we're here to talk more about the future. We're pleased to join with Major League Baseball in announcing the 2019 Play Ball Program. To help kick things off, we have Mr. Tony Regans, the Executive Vice President of Major League Baseball and Softball Development. Tony has been a good friend of ours. Uh, and Major League Baseball, and, and, and when we, Tony wants you to know that we appreciate Major League Baseball's support of all that we've been doing. He also has a special guest with him that he's going to be introducing. Tony? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. On behalf of Major League Baseball, our commissioner, Rob Manfred, we are simply here just to say thank you and express our gratitude for the relationship, the partnership with the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the Boys and Girls Clubs of America as it relates to our play ball initiative. In 2018, 303 of you mayors declared your cities as play ball cities and conducted events in your communities, impacting over 36,000 young people in your communities and 91,000 since the inception of the program. We'd like to thank um, President Benjamin, Tom McClyman, Tom Cochran, Jocelyn Bogan, Jared Aronowitz, Major League Baseball consultant, Doug Palmer, former mayor of Trenton, New Jersey, for their outstanding dedication and hard work in this effort. The genesis of the Play Ball Initiative and the relationship with the U.S. Conference of Mayors began with our special guest. She is an exceptional athlete, a tremendous student, and she can play ball. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Monet Davis. Thank you so much. Um, Good afternoon. Um, so many of you may or may not know, I'm Monet Davis. I'm from Philadelphia. Um, <laughs> I play four sports. I play basketball, baseball, soccer, and softball. Um, and at the age of seven, I was uh, fortunate enough to be asked to play on an all-boys baseball team um, down in South Philadelphia. And I was very nervous, but I just knew that sports was a part of my life since growing up. Um, I've always had an older brother, a bunch of older cousins, and they've just taught me sports. Um, but I got the opportunity to play for the boys team and it completely changed my life. Um, I, didn't, I wouldn't be the person that I am now if it wasn't for my coach and for my teammates. 
Um, and I've gotten to do a lot of cool things, like speak in front of all of you wonderful people. Um, I got to do a bunch of stuff with MLB baseball, um, and it, my life just isn't the same since then. But I just enjoyed every moment of it, and I just want people to give other kids around the country the same opportunity that I have, and it'll change their life. It'll change everyone's life. It'll just change the whole world. So you should go out, support, play ball, and give those kids the opportunity because it'll change everyone's life. Thank you. Thank you, Tony and Monet. And Monet, thank you for what you've done, what you will do for youth sports, your role model for our kids. Uh, best wishes as you continue your education at Hampton University. Uh, otherwise, no. I knew that I'd hear Doug Palmer yell as I said that, and, and I, I, he did not, did not disappoint. Uh, so, um, play ball is so much fun. It, it's even fun that uh, a, a lifelong Yankees fan who uh, is in a city that has a Mets affiliate will wear a Mets hat, uh, even support play ball. Um, we hope everyone will start planning their 2019 play ball event, and we're asking mayors to show their support uh, for baseball on opening day, uh, March 28th. Uh, please remember to wear the baseball hat of your favorite team and, and take a picture and post it on social media. Uh, look out for more details soon. So also, and, and I mentioned Doug Palmer. I want to thank uh, Doug for his incredible help with this piece of the puzzle, this veteran survey that Comcast has been incredibly supportive in helping us uh, pull together. Last October, the U.S. Comps and Mayors, with the support of Comcast, sent out uh, a survey to identify the successes and challenges mayors are facing as we seek to better serve veterans at the municipal level. Today, I'm pleased to announce the preliminary, preliminary findings of that survey. A one-page summary of those findings should be on the table in front of you. A more comprehensive uh, report will be made available in the next few months. Uh, let me first thank the 122 cities that responded uh, to our survey. 32 different states uh, participated. Uh, very quickly, I want to highlight a few of the key findings. We found that the top three challenges facing veterans are affordable housing, employment options, and homelessness. 79% of the cities we surveyed have formally committed to reducing homelessness, and more than half of the cities track veteran homelessness. A third of the cities have municipal transition or employment assistance for veterans, while a quarter of the cities have partnerships with employers and or post-secondary institutions for student veterans. We've also identified a few best practices in the report, including one from Washington, D.C., which provides on-demand, no-cost transportation program for vets to get health care to get health care appointments, job interviews, and educational opportunities. While many of us are addressing these issues, there's still so much more work to be done. I want to encourage everyone to review the preliminary report, share it with your local leaders back home. This is a community uh, response. And our, our hope is that uh, the findings from this report will help each of our cities continue to improve the services uh, and opportunities available for those who have served our great nation. Again, I want to thank Comcast and the Center for New American, Secur New American Security uh, for partnering with us to produce this report. Let's give them a well-deserved well round of applause. Let's, let's also give a round of applause to the men and women who served this, uniform, this country in uniform, please. We, we love to say that victory starts uh, in Columbia at Fort Jackson. We train a preponderance of the men and the majority of the women for the Army, and we believe strongly that we are indeed the greatest democratic nation in the history of the world because of the men and women who serve this country. Next, we're going to move to a chat about how cities can prepare for the future of work. We're living in a time where people choose where they want to live first and then find jobs. So we're going to have a discussion about enhancing what's already working in cities uh, to attract great new talent and new companies. Uh, think of it as le less about attracting HQ2 and more about helping cities understand how they can create HQ1 in their own cities. And our sponsor, WeWork, knows a little bit about that. Since it began in 2010, WeWork has changed the game on how and where people go to work by designing, building, and operating a global network of shared offices, 
um, workspaces and office services for individuals and their businesses. It allows entrepreneurs to get off the ground and out of the garage without worrying about filling a whole office or managing overhead expenses. It gives people, uh, people entrepreneurial people, uh, gets them together in new ways. It's a concept that's taken off in a number of cities, large and small, all across the country, indeed across the world. So now let me welcome our panel to the stage. First, we have Maria Camella, WeWork's global head of, reg and, uh, of reg global public policy and, uh, and public affairs. Next, we have noted urbanist, noted urbanist, I like that, uh, Richard Florida. Uh, if you've talked about bringing the creative class to your city, you certainly have to thank Dr. Florida. His most recent book, The New Urban Crisis, deals with increasing inequality, a deepening segregation, the failing middle class, uh, the part that mayors uh, and the part that mayors can play uh, in, in helping solve these challenging issues. And our, panel, our final panelist is no stranger to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. I'm so happy to welcome back our dear friend and past president Mick Cornett of Oklahoma City. <laughs> Mick has written a new book uh, called The Next American City, The Big Promise of Our Mid-Sized Metros. Oh, yeah. All right. So let's kick this off right, Dr. Florida. Uh, so what do you see happening uh, with the future of work uh, and the future of cities from your experience, uh, creative class to the new urban crisis? Please help us paint the scene. Well, you, you know better than I. I mean, I, I learned most of what I, I know from talking to mayors and talking from folks like Marie and companies, great companies like WeWork, which are defining the future. But look, my, my dad worked in a factory with a seventh grade education from the year about 1934, took time off to serve this country in World War II, came back, worked in that same factory till the day he retired in 1965. A high paying middle class job, put me and my brother through college, bought a house. Now you look at what's happened in work over the course of our lives. That blue collar middle class, only five to 6% of Americans work in a factory like my dad. 20% of Americans do some kind of blue collar work. They might drive a truck. Uh, they may do maintenance work, they may do mechanical work, uh, uh, they do construction. And then we have two big class groups I wrote about. This. The one group we talk about a lot is that creative class, the knowledge workers, the college grads, the people doing science and technology and business, building companies like we work, education, research. But the biggest class of all in America is the service class. Mm. Nearly 50% of Americans, disproportionately women, disproportionately minorities, disproportionately new immigrants to this country do low paid precarious work in the service class, making less than half what a knowledge worker makes. That's a big change and I think that's behind the divide. You mentioned that, Mayor, the divide in this country we have which is, is becoming paralyzing us. Now one, one optimistic note, you know, since I wrote that new book which you so kindly mentioned, by the way, you need to read this guy's book. I was so honored to be able to write the little forward chapter. It's incredible about the middle city and how it's coming back and what it's doing. But you know, going around talking to many of you mayors and many people in cities, what I see now is a real focus on, on how do we close this gap between the haves and the have-nots, the knowledge workers and the service workers, by working to upgrade that service job, making it a better job, doing what my, da my dad said. When I took a job working in a factory in 1934, it was crappy work, Rich. It took nine of us to make a family wage. Grandpa, grandma, me, my brother, my five sisters. I came back from the work, that manufacturing job was a good job. That's what we're seeing happening in cities now. Talking about raising minimum wage, about our starting wage. Uh, talking about how do you upgrade that job and give it more creative content. How do you get it, give those people more better work to do, customer involvement, how do you drive more profit and productivity. So at the end of the day, I know we have a problem, but I'm optimistic that we're gonna solve it right in our cities. Amen, mm -hmm. amen. So before I ask you, Maria, are you also a published author or no? I am not. I do okay. not have a I want to make sure I wasn't the only, the only uh, unpublished <laughs> author on the stage. Right now. You're in good company. Okay, okay, good deal, good deal. All right. So, Maria, where does, where does WeWork fit in, in, into all this? Um, how does WeWork fit into the, into the future of work, the future of cities, and how can you partner with mayors to not only encourage economic growth, but also the inclusive opportunity that Dr. Florida talked about? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it goes back to what you were talking about in the introduction of WeWork. And just to take a little bit of a step back for those of you who aren't as familiar with the company, you know, we started out with one location in New York City in 2010. And the idea was really to bring together, you know, space, design, technology to help entrepreneurs and small businesses either get a good idea off the ground or grow that small business. And today, you know, nearly 10 years later, we're, later we're in 100 cities, 27 countries, and have 400,000 members. And so, you know, this idea of being able to connect um, small businesses and entrepreneurs so that they could feed off the good ideas of other members, have access to flexible space, and then also, you know, have access to services that normally would be the typical barriers to growth and creating additional jobs is, is part of who we are and has really grown over the years to the point where we're not just servicing entrepreneurs and small businesses, but a third of our members are now uh, enterprise companies. So, you know, when we really look at cities, our primary objective is partnering with mayors. And I think um, from a very like practical standpoint, and this probably gives away my background, working in government for both the state of New York and the state of New Jersey, you know, when we work with a mayor, and all of you know this firsthand, you understand your cities. And we really feel like we have the ability to partner with you, one, on location. You know, where are the neighborhoods, where are the communities that are important to you that we can potentially be an accelerant for economic opportunity? So we've seen, you know, over the course of the years and from our data that, you know, when we stand up one WeWork building on a block, that 70% of the members in that building are coming to that neighborhood for the first time. Time. So not only are we providing you know, the ability for businesses to grow within your cities that are homegrown businesses, you know, we're also providing an economic ripple effect to the infrastructure around a building. So we've seen examples, and Denver's a great example of this, you know, where we partnered early with the city, we came into an area of downtown that was on the cusp of revitalization and really became you know, the anchor there. And that's really part of what we want to be doing as we move forward and really be in lockstep with mayors. And I think the other thing, too, to keep in mind, which we found a lot of success in, is when we partner with whatever your economic development entity is on the front end, you know, we tend to be a very easy way that an enterprise company who's looking to break into a new market can do so, right? Because it's a little bit of an easier lift. We find the space. They understand what they're getting from a product perspective in terms of the culture that it's being offered and the services. And so when we've been able to work with mayors up front and be that connection, you know, we're able to bring, you know, new businesses in a not as traditional sense. I think, you know, when you're kind of in government, this is from my experience, at least at the state level, you kind of look at economic development wins in a very specific way. Like, I have to bring one company in one very specific industry in order to say that I'm creating jobs. And I think we look at our ability to really be, you know, a way to grow, you know, homegrown businesses, an accelerant for your surrounding infrastructure, and then really do attract, you know, a multitude of different enterprise companies that represent a lot of different industries. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we've, we've enjoyed uh, partnering with WeWork and watching your growth. Um, we've seen so much of the dialogue and incredible growth in our, our, our big cities time and time again. The question is, what does this mean for rising cities? A, a, a majority of, of our cities in here are midsize mm -hmm. and, and, and smaller cities. And uh, Mick, borrowing from the uh, title of your book, how can a mayor in this room make sure that their city is the next great American city. Yeah, there are a lot of great examples in, in this room, you're right. And, and I, I urge mayors of, of mid-sized cities that now's the time. You're seeing a, a lot of young people um, looking around the country at where they want to live, and they're looking for things that are already available in a lot of mid-sized cities. Um, things like affordability. Um, maybe they would prefer to live in a much larger city, but they also realize that discretionary income matters. You know, what you can do in your spare time. It doesn't matter to be surrounded by a lot to do if you can't afford to do it. And mid-sized cities offer that affordability generally. You also have to be open to transportation options and be working on walkability and all sorts of, of whatever the next transportation trend is out there. I don't know if people will be on scooters five years from now, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people on scooters right now. And I think you, at your own peril, ignore those types of trends because young people want their city to be engaged in whatever it is that mobility means to them, but it probably doesn't mean stuck in a car on the freeway. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> traffic congestion is a big deal. You must be an inclusive city. I've never met a young person who didn't want to live in a city that, that had a high level of inclusivity to it. And the last one and that I'll mention 
and this sometimes is the most difficult, is I, I think you need to have some sort of cultural relevance to a larger conversation. Your city needs to be known for something or appreciated or acknowledged for something worldwide or nationally. People want to live in a city that they have something they can talk about. Mm -hmm. For Oklahoma City, we largely did that through sports, but you also can't be weak in the arts. Uh, you can't be weak in, in business opportunities and in projects like, like We Look and always be on the cutting edge. So, you know, uh, I, I, you know, when I was elected mayor, I remember someone coming up to me and says, what are you going to prioritize? Is it going to be the arts? Is it going to be sports? And I said, we're going to do it all. Because the answer is you can't have a weakness. You've got to be working on all of those things. Even if you haven't accomplished it today, you need an answer on how you're working to do it. Oh, absolutely. How do you make sure that, I mean, the mayors in here are from urban areas, suburban areas, and rural areas. Uh, Richard, how do you, how do you ensure, are there, are there key strategies that work in, in all three environments? Or, or what are your thoughts there? Well, I just want to echo what the, the mayor said, because what he said is so important. First, first thing is, I think with the Amazon HQ2, which you mentioned, I think that might be the last time we see a big company pick the political cities I love. I lived in both of them, political and financial capitals of the world. I think people are looking at these mm -hmm. mid-cities. Young people are looking at them, uh, not only because they're priced out, because the big cities have become not quite as interesting. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Everyone I know moving to New York, and I, I live part-time in New York, is older than me. Uh, who, that they're the people who can afford. So I think whether it's Pittsburgh, whether it's Oklahoma City, whether it's your city mayor, I think people, I think companies, you know, when you, Steve Case, a guy right from this town, with his rise of the rest, they're talking about really building and making investments in these mid cities. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. And I think personally in America, you know, and, and look, the trends are the trends. People were going to the big cities, they were going urban, but those trends reverse. I think we have this false dichotomy between urban, suburban and rural. You know, when we look at the survey data, you quoted some great survey data, about a third of the population likes living in a big city. And 40 or 50 percent of the population likes living in a nice suburb. <laughs> and 20 or some population likes living in a rural area. We, we can offer one of the great things about America. We can offer you a small city, a big city, a medium-sized city, a suburb, a rural area. The thing is, I think what the mayor said, a focus on inclusion a focus on emphasizing that creativity, that you can be who you want to be, a focus on having some options for transport. What I really love what this, what this man said was the idea of being part of a conversation. I think people want to be part of a place that matters. Being the best rural town, you know, I've been, I've been working in Bentonville a lot, seeing that transformation happen in tiny Bentonville and what's going on there. There's money in Bentonville? What? There's money in Bentonville? No, there's no money. <laughs> oh, okay. It's an interesting contrast, though. I'm not trying to, you know, you have one company moving, the other company stay and, and, and rebuilding. But I think, I think it's very interesting to look at a whole variety of experiments in making great communities. You look at that Hudson Valley outside of New York, where so many of the New Yorkers are going now just to have affordability, to have a place, to be part of a community. So I, I think, but, but you know, my, my old friend, Mayor Murphy from Pittsburgh, we go back a long time. He always says this, as a mayor, you have to be intentional. You can't just let the trends come at you. You have to shape and swerve those trends. So I think that idea of, of understanding the trends and being intentional about what you can do, and I think any size place, even, even places with real things going against them, can matter if you're intentional. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, before I come back to Maria, um, uh, it's interesting looking at the demography of where people choose to live that Dr. Florida just touched on. It almost lays out exactly where different opportunity zones are, uh, the 8,700 opportunity zones all, all across the country that we've been spending so much time talking about. I know, Mayor Cornette, you hosted the group uh, last night. You mind talking a little bit about opportunity yeah. zones and you think the, the role that you believe they can play in this discussion? Well, I think there's a lot of investment opportunities out there, but especially in mid-sized cities, there hasn't always been the access to capital. And so Opportunity Zones is a supply side initiative to try and address that access to capital. You know, if, if, you know in, in our part of the country, it always seemed like the very best development deal was in Dallas. I mean, if, 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 you know, if you had money to spend, there was always going to be somewhere in the Dallas Metroplex where that money should go. And it's, it's interesting, just here in the last year, um, Dallas-based Omni Hotels has invested $150 million in downtown Oklahoma City. So to see a Dallas-based company spend that type of capital in downtown Oklahoma City shows 
that, yeah, there are, there are trends taking place and money is starting to move away from the largest opportunities out there to mid-sized cities who offer you know, a better cap rate long term. Fantastic. Um, so beyond attracting the next HQ2, how do we leverage WeWork, Maria, um, the ecosystem to grow local businesses? I mean, how do we make it easier for global enterprises to set up regional hubs hand in hand the local workforce? How, how do we leverage it best? You know, I think, um, you know, I think again, it's really, this feels very simple, but, you know, from our perspective, you know, we're able to partner on the front end and work with mayor's offices. I mean, I can't emphasize this enough from a company perspective. Our number one objective when we go into a new market, a new city is if we haven't already is to get to know the mayor and the mayor's office, find out what issues are important to the mayor, figure out how we can work with them again, like I said, to identifying, you know, the right area that we should be looking, you know, to, to actually, you know, stand up our space to determine if there's anchor partner, so if, is there an anchor tenant, is there a company that we can work with the mayor to bring to that city if there isn't an anchor tenant already? Because, you know, when we have the ability to bring space, you know, a potential, you know, company that will serve as an anchor, we're able then to fill the rest of the space or potentially expand in the city to really serve those smaller companies that I think ultimately, you know, particularly for talking about smaller and mid-sized cities, you know, are the companies that you're going to want to see not just stay at the current level that they are, but really build into a larger company and create jobs. And I think as we're all sort of grappling with this idea of, you know, what are the future industries and how do we attract talent, right? You know, as much as, and certainly appreciating the point of having, you know, conversation and having the arts, you know, there's the other piece that brings young people and millennials is opportunity, right? So unless you have that economic opportunity, you have those jobs, you know, in the kind of space that, that you know, the millennial workforce is looking to be, um, you know, stimulated by, I think that becomes a tougher challenge. So, you know, I, I really do think it's as simple as us working together and, you know, it doesn't always, you know, it doesn't always come to the exact, you know, end result that we want for sure. But I think, you know, for us, it's an, and I'm gonna, we're really unoriginal because our email is also mayors at wework.com. So please email that. But, you know, I encourage, you know, anyone in this room that is interested in partnering and interested in having this conversation, we want to have this conversation. And I feel, you know, for us, community is really, you know, one of our primary values as a company. And, you know, we want to walk the walk on this. And that's why, you know, it's not just saying that mayors and cities are our partners. It's actually, you know, bearing that out. So um, please, so, e please email us. <laughs> it's mayors at wework.com. Yes. I guarantee you have 10 emails from Rochester Hills, Michigan already. Well, uh, this, uh, this is good uh, because uh, the staff told me not I, to give out my cell phone. Tell your friend Brian <laughs> uh, uh, already in your inbox. Excellent. So, so um, Dr. Florida, what's next? Well, I, I think this comment about ecosystems is really important, and it's where we got a little off track with the HQ2 thing. I think when I look around being doing this now for more than three decades, visiting many, many of your cities, what was so striking is 30 years ago, no one talked about an ecosystem. They talked about luring a manufacturing plant, grabbing this, the other thing. We've built, you've built, clusters, whatever we call it, talent clusters, industry, we built these ecosystems and now you go to any town, they can tell you what the ecosystem is, they can tell you what the clusters is, they can tell you talent. WeWork's really interesting because, you know, with, with relocation of people, if you have a WeWork, you know, there's a network there you can leverage, but I think one of the things that's happened in that development of those ecosystems, they tended to benefit the highly educated, the knowledge worker, the techie, the university grad, but that other 50% of us fell further behind, and I think what's next is inclusive ecosystems. That's what I think, you know, I've been talking a lot to Mayor Hancock about this in Denver because, you know, they've seen that, like many mayors, they've seen that boom in Denver, the housing get more expensive, right? And, 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 a, and a third's doing, or 40% is doing really well, but 50 or 60% are sinking. I think the, the next idea is how do we, it, and it's not just equity, don't get me wrong, I'm all for equity. It's not just equity for equity sake. What I think you mayors do is can create an inclusive ecosystem that has inclusive growth, that's bringing equity and development together. And I had a very, a very senior economic developer say this to me. I went to their conference, the, the, the Economic Development Council conference. And he said, you know, economic development isn't just about growing your economy. 
Economic development is about developing the full capacity of human beings, of your people. And if you're not doing that, if 30 or 40 or 50 percent are falling behind, you're not developing. You have an unbalanced economy. So I think what's next, and I think the pressure is going to come to you, but I also think it's going to come, fortunately, WeWork is doing it right, to some of the tech companies that aren't partners in this. I, I can see a backlash in, in what I worry about. If you ask me what, I, what keeps me up at night, it's not even the dysfunction in Washington. Because the, the hundreds and thousands of cities are what this economy is made up. But it's not a Washington economy anymore, it's you. It's thousands and hundreds of cities building these ecosystems. What keeps me up at night is the backlash against this. If we get a backlash which says technology is no good and innovative companies are no good and they're driving up my housing prices and my city isn't going to heck and I want to ban them, that's a terrible thing for American ingenuity. So I think our future is really about how in community, doing it our own way. There's no one way. There's thousands of ways. How do we make these ecosystems and clusters inclusive? How do we make better jobs for low-wage people in precarious employment? How do we make housing more affordable? And how do we make cities and, and uh, suburban areas, rural areas for everybody? Sure. Uh, Mika and Maria, 30 seconds. Any final thoughts before uh, we wrap this up? The importance of connectivity. The people that are moving to your cities have connections throughout the rest of the world. The people that have left your city yep. still have connections in your city. Those connections in today's connected world lead to economic development and growth and a lot of positive things. So figure out ways to make sure your city is taking advantage of all the connections that your city already has. Leverage them. How about that? And Maria, final word? Mayors at WeWork.com. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you all right. Mayor. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Conference of Mayors CEO and Executive Director Tom Cochran. Thank you very much. Thinking about mayors, I've gone to the good book. I've gone to the Old Testament. And I visited the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 62, verse 6. On your walls and at your gates, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day, all the night. They shall never be silent. And those who put the Lord in remembrance take no rest all the day all the night, never silent, taking no rest. Eight days after we left Boston, we were in El Paso, Texas. We went to Tornillo, Texas, and we saw, we saw what was happening there. Steve Benjamin took us there. Democratic mayors, Republican mayors, Never silent about children separated from their parents in a prison camp. Steve Benjamin took 20 mayors to the inauguration of the president of Mexico. First time ever. Steve Benjamin had the idea 
of a Smart Cities Institute. And we went to New York City and joined with the president of New York University to create the first <clears throat> Smart Cities Institute and we went to Montgomery, Alabama with our brother, Brian Stevenson, to see the lynching museum and launched our Compassionate Center, Inclusion and Compassionate Center. And we went to Bristol, England to be with other mayors around the nation. And we went to San Francisco talking about climate when nobody else would. For six months, he has not stopped. Ladies and gentlemen, here is six months of 2018. Here is the United States Conference of Mayors. Here is the pure, unadulterated personification of leadership Stephen Benjamin, the 70th president of the United States Conference of Mayors. Roll the video, you ain't seen nothing yet. The role of mayor and the role that we play in American democracy is often understated. We fought for over 80 years for the people in America's cities, always for the right thing. The nation's mayors are here to call attention to a shameful condition and certainly to call on the administration to reunite as quickly as possible the thousands of children who have been separated from their parents. The mayors you see before you are Democrats and Republicans. We're united in our fight for justice. We're united in our fight for what is right. We're a country that upholds the unwavering values of inclusion, compassion, and respect. We know that the mayor is involved every single day on creating jobs and, and creating safe communities. What we don't think about as much is our role in creating the proper tone in which our citizens treat each other by, how we actively play a role in creating compassionate cities uh, for all people, how, we, how the, the art of inclusion it is, is not just led by head and heart, but also by really intentional leadership. For those of you who may not know, the United States Conference of Mayors has taken a leadership role in the area of climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, since 2005, building more resilient communities and creating a more sustainable future. These are wonderful, strong, healthy, inclusive incubators of what it means to be an American. It's on infrastructure and innovation and on inclusion. And in seeing radical inclusion uh, in action and to have people here from all across the world doing amazing things, it shows the power of the human spirit. We need more people who care about the cultural fabric, the spiritual fabric, the fact that we are all in this together, uh, serving in public office. You can make a dramatic change in the lives of the people who need you. So while there's so much more work to be done, uh, and the battle often sometimes feels uphill, uh, there's still certainly hope uh, for uh, good governance all across America at all levels. Mayors will lead that charge. But mark my words, uh, the mayors are not ever going to slow down. What you see here in the camaraderie and the humor, what you see are genuine friendships. They've extended across this organization for over 80 years. As goes America City, so goes America, the greatest democratic nation in the history of the world.
That was incredibly humbling, and I dare say uh, undeserved uh, as well. Uh, my wife DeAndre and I were, were figuratively paralyzed about three years ago. Uh, as we watched our daughter Bethany, she was then 10 years old, uh, share with our, our, our Baptist pastor uh, a story about the preacher who'd gotten uh, so incredibly fed up with the deacons and, and trustees at the church that he decided to skip church that Sunday and go, go hunting. He enjoyed hunting. So as we walked through the forest for a few uh, hours, he heard some rustling and thought it was that deer he'd been looking for. Uh, regrettably, it wasn't a deer. It was an eight-foot-tall bear uh, standing there looking, looking right at him. Uh, he took a shot at the bear. The bear was unfazed. It was coming right at him. He stumbled, twisted his ankle, and did all he could at that point. Uh, he said, God, I'm sorry for skipping church <laughs> this Sunday. If you deliver me from this, I promise to make up with the deacons. I'll even kiss the trustees. Uh, Lord, the only thing I ask of you right now is to please make this bear a Christian. <laughs> at that moment, the bear stopped in its tracks. It hit its knees and said, Lord, please bless this food I'm about to receive. <laughs> I've learned the jobs that we all do every single day. We've got to be specific in what we're asking for. <laughs> we're here in Washington, our mid-year meeting, our winter meeting every year, to be very specific on what we're requesting from our leaders in Washington, D.C., and we've been blessed to have leaders from both sides of the aisle come to hear what mayors have to say. As our mayors from across America focus on infrastructure and innovation and inclusion, we're helping to lead the country towards a more united and more prosperous future. On priorities like sensitive reform, environmental management, fighting opioid addiction, and agriculture and nutrition, we saw last year that meaningful, bipartisan, bicameral compromise is indeed possible in Washington, D.C. Our mayors were essential in making sure that these changes happen. When coalitions of bipartisan leaders like ours, as large as ours, take a stand, people listen. So I want to encourage you, be engaged, be involved. Let's continue to push the envelope. But I'm also not blind to reality. As we, get, as we gather here in our nation's capital, hundreds of thousands of public workers, public servants, are struggling to feed their families because they're not allowed to go to work. All the while, vital services are not being provided, and this is simply unacceptable. We should find comfort that opportunities for a federal evolution of finding hope and strong roots at the local level. Our nation's roads, bridges, transportation networks, and water systems not only need to be repaired, but modernized with cutting edge green technology. We know that public access keep our citizens, their families, and their businesses moving forward. And city after city, region after region, in this room, local leaders are doing what has to be done to keep our vital systems functioning. And some are doing much more than that. But overall, our infrastructure still across this country earns a D-plus grade. And this hurts our efforts to compete on the world stage. It's long past time that Washington accept its responsibility and partner with cities to provide the transportation, water, and energy systems our citizens deserve, have every right to expect, and that our metro economies demand. We must preserve this great nation we've inherited, build for the future, build it for our children and generations yet to come. As we do so, increased prosperity and revitalized community identity will propel us all to the very next level. That's why in 2019, this must be the year that we redefine the movement of people to our cities. Comprehensive immigration reform will move forward to the drumbeat of our collective will. If we're engaged in pushing forward on a compromise, we can get something happening here in Washington, D.C. Yes, it's possible. It is possible to increase border security while at the very same time accepting the fact that there are millions of hardworking people in this country who, while not officially documented, strengthen the economic health and cultural vitality of our cities and this great nation. The American dream is not dead. The American dream is not dead. It's more alive now than ever, if we will it. Our elected officials must, 
I repeat, must lead in a way that brings about meaningful action that benefit the whole of our nation. How do we maintain tradition while adopting new and maybe even unfamiliar elements of humanity into our diverse culture? Our mayors know how it's done because we do it every single day. We've addressed these opportunities with courage, with compassion, and ingenuity. We can do it. We have to teach the folks here in Washington how to do it. As our cities grow, sustainability is paramount. When we talk to our constituents, we walk to work or spend time with our own families, environmental concerns are ever present. Rain, wind, and fire can destroy economic and personal security instantaneously. We've seen it happen in our city, as many of you, as many of you have. At the very same time, that same wind and sunshine and water can bring hope and new growth. For decades, mayors have collectively raised climate awareness and established policy precedents on how we deliver a new green infrastructure. We are in the moment to make a new American commitment possible to responsible environmental stewardship. Our country needs it now more than ever. While Washington is gridlocked over a wall on the southern border, it's imperative that we unite around the truth that, if not actively confronted, climate change could force us to build unimaginably costly walls along our oceans and our rivers that feed our great nation. In pursuit of this better future, we should be happy that bipartisan is indeed a reality right here in this room. The United States Conference of Mayors pushes us to share what works and champions policies to look past ideological and demographic differences. I want to encourage all of our new mayors who are here in the room to meet your colleagues and share best practices. Of all the great things that we've shared uh, throughout the day, the very best thing you will take from this engagement is interfacing with your colleagues and taking ideas back home to help make your city better. We are driven by public service, and now we need to drive public action. Washington must shed the ideas of stalemate and don the armor of compromise. Whatever emotions we feel on this path, it's our duty to be courageously compassionate, listening and responding to the demands of the people in, in, as to how we move America forward. Mayors must place individual stories, real human stories at the intersection of large scale data. We have to humanize the tragedies that we're seeing out there. If we do that, then we, will, we can address the challenges and create incredible opportunities for all of our people. Mayors must have the heads and the hearts to advocate tirelessly for our citizens. And mayors, uh, we have to view change as, a, as, as an inescapable messenger of, of opportunity. Opportunity is certainly before us. I think about, I dream about, and I pray for our two daughters every single day. I love them more than life itself. I get up in the morning to make the world a better place for them today, tomorrow, and in years to come. I know that every single one of us in this room feels the same way about our families. And our collective love extends to all in our cities and together this entire nation. The actions that we take, the leadership that we choose to exhibit will leave a mark well beyond our city's municipal boundaries and our time in office. Each of you being a member of this collective that we call the United States Conference of Mayors is a recognition of our oneness. The future is in our hands. So let's get started. Thank you all so much for your incredible work, your support of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Our leadership is needed in America now more than ever. God bless you. At this time, we were going to hear from our good friend, the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, uh, who chairs the United States Conference of Mayors Infrastructure Task Force uh, and helps lead our, our infrastructure efforts in Congress. As, as many of you know, unfortunately, Mayor Garcetti uh, couldn't be with us today because of a late-breaking agreement, I might add, between the LA Teachers Union and the school district that, that he helped to bring together. <laughs> We're still excited that he, can he will still be with us tomorrow, and I want to congratulate Mayor Garcetti on his leadership 
uh, to bring an end to the strike and, and thank him for his tireless support of teachers, students, and parents. Uh, he continues to focus on what unites us and our shared goals, not on division. So Mayor Garcetti and I led a meeting of the Infrastructure Task Force right before Thanksgiving to develop our collective recommendations that we would make to Congress on a national infrastructure agenda. We have five key points to our plan. Go over them briefly. Transportation, water, energy, community infrastructure, and tax incentives. Uh, that's going to be our focus. On transportation, we must secure the solvency of the Highway Trust Fund and grow future spending for our roads, transit systems, and bridges, and direct more of these funds locally. Invest more in our airports and spend down funds collected to improve our ports. In the water and wastewater area, our federal partner needs to step up by boosting funding and revamping how loans uh, get delivered to cities and grants as well under the state revolving funds, as well as erase the backlog of U.S. Army Corps of Engineer projects. On energy infrastructure, it's time to reactivate the energy efficiency and conservation block grant program that we all use so effectively to help update our cities. We need to invest in local infrastructure by increasing the community development block grant funding to spur neighborhood projects and drive more resources into brownfields uh, to get these sites cleaned up and redeveloped. And finally, Congress must revisit the tax code to restore advanced refunding of tax exempt bonds and extend the renewable energy production tax credits. We all need our federal leaders to come together and, and get something passed now so that we can address our nation's mounting infrastructure needs. Please feel comfortable about presenting these ideas to your congressional delegations in your visits this week to the Hill and thereafter. Uh, it, I want you to be comfortable with the priorities and staff is available to make sure that we, we, we can help humanize it to some specific issues that you're dealing with at home and never be reticent about telling your federal legislators that we're not talking about federal money as if it's manna falling from heaven. These are our tax dollars, guys. Our tax dollars that we want repatriated back home to work for our citizens. So that's what we're talking about. With that said, uh, please stay in the ballroom. Uh, very soon, we're going to be joined by our featured speaker. So um, we're, we're, we're excited about that. So y'all uh, commiserate, network, meet a stranger, and we're going to have some fun in a little bit. Thank you. God bless you. everyone. There are so many wonderful things I could say about our next guest. Uh, she's a daughter of a mayor, the sister of a mayor, a person who's still with our uh, leadership, a partnership with this organization in good times and in very difficult times. Um, she worked with us to pass and fund an energy block grant that made a significant difference in the fight against climate change. She helped to stop the worst recession in modern times uh, from turning into, this, into a depression and help lead our nation to its, a period of strong economic growth. She's always welcomed mayors into her office, regardless of political party, and has always taken time to be with us at our national meetings. In fact, she committed to being here at this winter meeting well before the congressional recess was canceled. She was going to fly back across the country just to be here with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. As we face continuing challenges and opportunities related to priorities such as the nation's uh, infrastructure challenges uh, and world climate crisis, uh, we're so fortunate that our nation has, uh, as a featured guest, our featured guest, leading the United States House of Representatives. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor Benjamin, for your warm introduction, and thank you all for your warm welcome. And Mr. Benj Mayor Benjamin, thank you uh, for your great service to the City of Columbia and to the country. Let us all salute the strong leadership of the mayor, of all of the mayors. Congratulations to all of you for what you do. And I want to make my personal congratulations to Tom Cochran, who has been such a, a resource to this organization for so long. He was here when my brother was mayor a long time ago, and he's still, he's still here. Thank you, Tom Cochran. That's an applause line. I'll let you know. Again, it's a personal as well as official honor to bring greetings to America's mayors on behalf of the U.S. Congress. It's a joy to welcome my mayor, Mayor London Breed, to Washington. And uh, again, as the daughter and the sister of a mayor, as Mayor Benjamin indicated, I have a front row seat to the extraordinary work that you do for our country and for our democracy, for our people. Cities are the engines of human innovation in our nation. Your success is the foundation of America's success. You come at a time when the government is shut down. Sadly, with this shutdown, the White House is not showing respect for the American people. The senseless and prolonged shutdown is inflicting chaos across the country, uh, and certainly in Washington, D.C., on public safety, on civil aviation, on housing, on health and financial security, and every other dimension of families' lives. I know, as the daughter and sister of a mayor, that there is no buffer between a mayor and his or her constituents. You hear the stories, you know the pain, you feel it, you know that this shutdown must end, and it must end now. <clears throat> On day one and since, the Democratic Congress has acted to end the chaos and restore certainty to people's lives. This afternoon, and that's why I'm running a few minutes late, the House is passing a package of bipartisan legislation agreed to by the House and Senate negotiators to reopen government. To, get, to reopen government. With strong border security initiatives. This will be our 10th vote. Do you want to see, let's hear it for border security. <laughs> This will be our 10th vote to reopen government. Mind you, just, just remember this. In our, in our earlier votes, we were, and from the first day that we were sworn in on January 3rd, on that day, we sent the Senate legislation that they had already passed, 92 to 6, something like that. Some of it unanimously in committee. We said, take yes for an answer. We're sending you the Republican Senate agenda to the Republican Senate. And they said no. Today, we are sending them the same packages, except because some of our House members said, why should we vote the Republicans in the House? And why should we vote with the Republicans in the Senate? But the Senate did. Why don't we do what we acted upon with them? So today, taking their suggestion, we are sending the House Senate negotiated bipartisan, bicameral legislation for them to consider. We'll see how the Republicans in the House vote on their own suggestion. We'll see how the Republicans in the Senate vote on their own legislation. But it's really unfortunate that not only is the president holding the American people and America's workers hostage, he's holding the Republicans in the Congress of the United States hostage. Not all of them. Some of them understand what it means in the lives of the American people. We hope that more of them will. Congressional Democrats support smart, effective border security, but we do not support the president holding the health, safety, and paychecks of the American people hostage again to a campaign applause line. There is serious and justified concern that this president would shut down the government any time he does not get his way legislatively. That is why we must hold the line on this shutdown in government. That is one of the reasons Democrats and Republicans, and I know this is a bipartisan group, beautifully so, and to the Republicans in the crowd, I say, take back your party, the grand old party. America needs a strong Republican party, not a rubber stamp. Republicans alike, Democrats and Republicans alike must urge their senators 
to support the bipartisan legislation to reopen government that will be on the floor tomorrow. Tomorrow, we must reopen government now to restore, respect our workers, to protect our borders, and to meet the needs of the American people. That is what is not, people have to understand there's a purpose to the governance of our, you know it better than anyone, the public role in meeting the needs of people. People's needs are not being met when these people are not being uh, employed, uh, working and getting paid for their work. The American people elected a House majority that would, that's an applause line. <laughs> not for everybody, maybe that will deliver, deliver results for the people, opening up new opportunities and improving their lives. We have the opportunity and therefore the responsibility to get to work, redeeming the promise of the American dream for every family and advancing progress for every community. We must build, 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 build our human infrastructure, invest in our physical infrastructure and build our democracy. Today, too many hardworking families are asking, is this the t in this time of innovation and globalization, they're asking if they have a place in the economy of tomorrow. You hear that all the time. We all, mayors, members of Congress alike, must answer them and say, we will have an economy that works for you, for every person in our country. We must build an economy that gives all Americans the tools they need to succeed in the 21st century. Public education, workforce development, good paying jobs, and secure pensions. Just as we must invest in human infrastructure for our nation, we must invest in our physical infrastructure. The House is committed to bold, transformative action to rebuild America with green, modern, and job-creating infrastructure from sea to shining sea, and may I... <laughs> may I acknowledge another California mayor, Mayor Garcetti, for his leadership in building the infrastructure in Los Angeles in a very major way. Investing in our crumbling roads, bridges, and transit systems, and modernizing our ports and airports, rebuilding our children's schools to provide safe, modern learning experiments. We say to kids, education is important. You must study, you must learn, and yet they get a different message. We send them to a school that is not up to par for them. Mayor Palmer and I and, when Trent, and uh, Trenton a, a while back were watching kids learn how to build green infrastructure in the schools there. So some of you have taken the lead in a very important way, and I've been here when you've received your awards uh, for uh, infrastructure. I've been here when you received your awards for the arts. I'll get that back to that, the arts in a moment. Bringing broadband internet to every corner of the country and fixing our broken water system so that every family has access to clean, safe drinking water. Some of our water systems are over 100 years old. They're made of brick and wood. Brick and wood building the sustainable, resilient infrastructure of the future in a way that protects clean air, clean water, creates good paying jobs, and combats, combats the climate crisis. We must embrace the three I's, your theme, building our infrastructure in a way that is innovative and inclusive. Congratulations on your leadership in all three regards. We know that you are ready to stop talking and start digging. We want to see dirt fly is what we want to see when we uh, allocate these resources. And I'm optimistic because one subject that uh, I have some common ground with the president on is the subject of infrastructure. Maybe 80% of the conversations I've had with him since his election have been about infrastructure. We have to find our common ground. We're ready. We're ready, and hopefully he is too, so that we can get moving on that. To create good paying jobs, we know how important it is. Improve the quality of life, promote commerce, it's so important. Clean air, clean water uh, from all of that, uh, those investments. We applaud America's mayors for stepping up to deliver quality infrastructure for your citizens. The House will do our part to support you, and will do so in a way that does not shift the burden onto your budgets. Last year, they had an infrastructure plan that went from 80% federal, 20% local, to 20% uh, federal, 80% local. 
What? <laughs> what? Are, are you kidding? Must have been. But that's, uh, we will not make, uh, we, want, we want it to happen. Uh, and we don't want it to happen uh, in a way that is not uh, predictable, affordable, and again, with a return. When you're doing infrastructure, I talked to Jerry Brown about this this morning. He was in my office about our, what happened in California with the, uh, the tax initiative that was on the ballot. When people see what they get for any investment in infrastructure, they always support the infrastructure. The Congress, though, needs your leadership and partnership to deliver on many of our shared priorities to drive common progress for all. Together, we'll make America more safe by passing common sense legislation to end the epidemic of gun violence. Well, we will make America more American by protecting DREAMers and TPS recipients. and passing comprehensive immigration reform. We will make America more just by protecting people with pre-existing conditions, expanding access to health care, and lowering the price of prescription drugs, and defending Medicare and Medicaid. And we will strengthen our democracy by passing the Equality Act, that is an act to end discrimination against LG. LGTB community, and so we're very excited about that. And our first bill, HR1, to clean up corruption in Washington to bring dignity to government by lowering the impact of dark, secret, special interest money in the political scene and empowering people, removing obstacles to participation and passing the Voting Rights Act. There are two challenges, uh, well, actually three, that I want to just close with. And that is, are the, these are the, these, here they are. <laughs> One is the sinfulness, the immorality of the disparity of income in our country. It is so stunning and remarkable. Say 40 years ago or a little bit more, the disparity in income between the, and we've had this conversation before, but it just gets worse. The um, disparity in income be between the CEO and the worker was about 40%. And when productivity increased, everyone's pay increased, the CEO and the worker. Now, it's about 350 to 400% the CEO. Many CEOs really earned as much as their employees were earned it in a year, in the first couple of weeks in January. Certainly by now. 40, 35, 350 to 400 times the CEO pay to the workers pay. That just simply has to end. We do not begrudge anyone their success, their wealth, but we don't want to see an exploitation of the workforce in order to achieve that. So that is part of our For the People agenda, to reduce that disparity. And in doing so, to increase the purchasing power that our workers have. The middle class purchasing power is the most significant stimulus to the economy. Secondly, we have to talk about uh, the, uh, our planet. Uh, I was going to say the denial that some are in our planet, but let's be in a more positive vein. <laughs> uh, we know that the cl uh, climate crisis uh, is a crisis in many ways. First of all, it challenges the air our children. It's a public health issue. Clean air, clean water, food safety. It's a public health issue. Air pollution, Pope called it air pollution. That drives it home for people who think of climate crisis as removed from their lives. Climate crisis, public health. Climate health crisis, our economic success to be number one globally in terms of green technologies. So it's an economic challenge. It's a national security challenge. Generals, gov generals, admirals, et cetera, national security people come to us and tell us that this is a national security challenge in terms of, of conflicts that erupt because of, of uh, limitation of assets, migrations that occur, droughts, 
weather conditions uh, that, that challenge the communities that people live in and create unease, unrest, and our national security. And it's a moral issue. If you believe, as I do, that this planet is God's creation, I join our, with our evangelical community in doing so, that this is God's creation, and we have a moral responsibility to be good stewards of it, then we must be good stewards of it. And for our, if you don't share that view, but you do agree that we owe it to future generations to pass on the planet in a responsible way, uh, then again, it is a moral issue. So that is one of the challenges we face, and I'm pleased to announce that I have established a, climate, a select committee on climate once again. We had one when I was speaker before, and we have it again now. So this is about creating good paying, good paying green jobs. Good paying green jobs. And uh, uh, ending some of the denial there, that is there. Secondly, is, uh, I said disparity of income, the climate third it is. This is uh, something that I think hits home, no pun intended, with many of you, and that is the housing crisis, the homelessness issue that exists in our country. We have to think in a very dra drastic way about this. And I'll quote Dr. King. Dr. King said, this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Tranquilizing gravity. We cannot think incrementally. We have to think big. And Maxine Waters, who's the chair for financial services uh, committee, thinks big in this way. We need to be working with you to hear your ideas about how we can address uh, the housing crisis and how we can increase the stock, make it uh, everything more affordable, and, and meet the challenge to conscience that homelessness is in our country, especially our veterans. Our veteran, well, for everyone, for our families. I bring back to the veterans because the veterans are so hurt by the shutdown. You know, a third of our workforce, federal workforce, are veterans. Uh, they come from the military, take off the uniform, but continue in service to our country in such an important way. And it's not, uh, we do a disservice to them. We do not appreciate the work that they do. And one way to hurt them is to have their credit ratings uh, be lessened because they do not have the paycheck in a timely fashion to pay their bills, their rent, their mortgage, their car payment, their credit card bill. And if you really want to hurt a veteran, you might uh, have an impact on some of them from their security clearances. The security clearance is affected by your credit rating. So there's so many ways that this shutdown that I began my remarks with and now I end with do a disservice uh, to our country, and again, must end. Uh, our journey will not be easy to deliver on all the priorities for the people. We must embrace innovation, inclusion. We have to just establish your, your model that you have put forth here today. Uh, we're coming back to it here. <laughs> you know it, In infrastructure. Innovation, inclusion. So guided by, by uh, bold thinking, inspired by the priorities of those whom we are honored to serve, we can meet the challenges of our time. Uh, I talked this week, we marked the 90th year, 90 years since the birth of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Imagine he was only 39 years old, barely old enough to be president himself, and yet he has a monument on the mall, he has a day in his honor because of his values and his leadership and his courage. Decades since the March on Washington, his, still, his words still ring powerfully clear and true. And I'll repeat, this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. So. So I congratulate you. I know that some of you will be honored tomorrow for your work in the arts, and let me thank you for that. I do believe that one way that we can all come together in our country is through the arts. It is, a, it is a, an area where we all, um, uh, shall we say, put aside our differences. We laugh together, we cry together, we're inspired together. Uh, it gives children confidence that they can do other things if they can and, uh, be creative. Poet Shelley once wrote, the greatest force for moral good 
is imagination. So I'd add that I to your infrastructure, inclusion, and innovation, imagination. Uh, you are masters of it. You have to be every single day. Uh, so uh, again, I congratulate those who will be honored for their contribution to the arts. The mayors have all been in the forefront of that for so long, recognizing how important it is to infrastructure, innovation, and inclusion. Together, let us move forward to make the promise of progress for every family in every community and city across the nation real. Thank you all for your leadership. Madam Mayor, Mr. Mayor, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Speaker Pelosi, for being here with us, for support, always supporting the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And um, this, this session is adjourned, guys. Let's get to our best practices workshops. Thank you, Mr.